Good afternoon and welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinar Series, our premier digital educational platform featuring a variety of interactive programs to provide you timely, engaging, and essential education when and where you need it most. My name is Brian Gilbert, the Deputy Director of Events here at NCIA, and as always, I'm very excited to welcome you all to another edition of our monthly Catalyst Conversations programs, today being presented and facilitated by members of NCIA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Before we get started, a final note and thank you to our guests joining us for the live stream on our Facebook. If you're an active NCIA member, follow that short link in our description to log into your account and join the conversation. If you're not an active NCIA member, follow the Join Now link to activate your membership or the Register Now link to purchase a pass so you don't miss out on today's invaluable programming. Now, let's get this show on the road. In today's program entitled Demystifying Facilities Design Planning, our panelists will help attendees better understand facilities design planning by sharing pragmatic steps from how to choose a company to work with, what questions to ask, and most importantly, how much is all this going to cost? So to kick things off, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's session, Christine De La Rosa, CEO and national co-founder of the People's Dispensary to the virtual stage to introduce our packed panel of cannabis facility design experts. <laughs> Christine, you can activate your video feed now and take it away from here. Awesome. Hey everybody, how are you doing today? I'm so excited that you're here. Um, I believe that this is one of the webinars that I wish I had had back when we started in 2016. So I'm super excited to moderate it. I'm super excited to introduce you to the people that we have on. Um, I really appreciate everybody on the panel for taking time out of their very busy days. I mean, there's just so much going on in the cannabis industry right now. Um, we have New York legalization, shout out to New York. We have um, New Mexico about to be legalized. Woohoo! We have federal legislation happening. We have Chuck Schumer saying that it's gonna go, they're gonna start doing stuff. We have Safe Banking Act. So there's a lot of stuff going on for everybody who's an owner or part of an ancillary business of the cannabis industry. So always appreciate their time. Um, I'm gonna let the panelists uh, introduce themselves so the panelists can bring up their video feeds. That would be awesome. Great. I'm gonna start with Jade. Jade, would you like to start with introducing yourself to the group? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Jade Heiler, and I currently work as an architecture intern architect at Fishback in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I'm also leading the marketing efforts for our new cannabis initiative. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to talk about what I do all day. Awesome. Latoya, how about if you go next? Hello everyone, my name is LaToya Rucker. I'm the COO of Collexium. Collexium is a women-owned, female-owned, minority-owned cannabis uh, cultivation and processing brand here in the city of Detroit. I've uh, been a caregiver in the Michigan market since 2009. And um, I started growing cannabis for my grandmother uh, when she was diagnosed with uh, fibromyalgia. So I am a caregiver and also an operator. Awesome. Brian, how about you go? Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Brian. I am principal of Anderson Porter Design Architects. We're a team of about 15 architects located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we practice nationally and internationally uh, since 2014. We have been designing cultivation facilities, extraction and manufacturing facilities, packaging facilities, as well as retail. So uh, super happy to be here and uh, look forward to the conversation. Awesome. Jacques, why don't you go next? All right, I'm next. So everybody, hello. My name is Jacques Santucci. I'm the president of Nucleus One. <clears throat> it's a business performance and operation consulting firm. We're based on the East Coast, but we actually practice uh, nationwide from the East Coast to Hawaii. We specialize in business planning, licensing, um, business operation and design for cannabis uh, companies. And uh, prior to that, I was also an operator. I started a company called Wellness Connection of Maine back 10 years ago, who now has uh, over 90 employees, uh, 50,000 square feet of a manufacturing site and four stores. And then I've been involved as, an, as a partner, as an, an, an consultant in, in, a, in a bunch of other operations. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having us. All right. Thank you all for joining us. So we're going to just dive right in. Um, 
there's the, the very first question, which is open to everybody, anybody who wants to answer it. Um, one of the reasons I'm excited to have Latoya on here, and also Jack, is this shock, as his former operators, they really understand facilities planning and design as they've done that for their own systems. So my very first question um, for our listeners who are with us on the webinar is when and why you should start planning to open, if you're opening a facility, you should engage a facility planner. So when should they do it and why should they do it at that time? Personally, for me, we engaged ours way too late and we had to do a lot of cleanup. So I want people who are entering the industry to know when that should happen. Well, I'll say, I think it's important to engage um, essentially when you're starting to look at the real estate mm -hmm. um, because there's so many different issues that could come up um, You know, once you purchase the building and it's yours. So you wanna to try to mitigate um, you know, any issues and just understand what you're kind of walking into uh, from the very beginning before you even sign a purchase agreement, have an architect, have a, an engineer, someone come out and just look at the state of the current building. Um, and in Detroit, we have a lot of buildings that are quote unquote in the green zone, uh, but they need a lot, a lot of development. So I think it's important to do that right out of the gate. Well, in my case, I think I'll use the words of Brian Anderson, who said once to me, think about the cost of not having one. And I think, you know, like you said, Christine, you know, you hired yours too late. And I think we all made that mistake at some point or the other. If you don't, if you don't design uh, early on, then the cost of changing, the cost of redoing it, is um is 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 more but to me it's even before the building it's actually the design of the business right i i'm i'm a business uh, person and and what what i do is always think about what's next and and i'm trying to plan and so the financial model the business plan all relates to the design of the facility and before even you have your real estate even even before you actually hire brian or Jade to design the space, you need to have a budget, you need to have a mission for your company. And so the business planning to me is, is, is part of the, 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 the facility design, sorry, is part of the business planning. And then in actually in some of the financial model we do, we actually design the facility in numbers, right? And then Jade and Brian gonna put it in, in, in squares and rounds and, and paper, but in our case, you know, uh, when you want to design your, your business and you think you want to produce a thousand pound a month of whatever it is, then it calculates how, many, how much space you, you need or how much retail space you need. And, and all this comes just from the beginning, from the financial planning and the, the business, uh, the business uh, modeling. Thank you so much for that, Jack. I think that's such an important moment is how much do you want to produce if you're a cultivator? How much do you want to manufacture if you're a processor? How much do you want to sell? What is your basket size and, and you know, amount per square footage that you want to realize? And I think you're right. That is coming even before we hire the before we hire the designer or the architect to really go in and figure out how do you make those numbers work in your space. Yeah, right. and I want to build on what um, both Jack and Latoya said. It's really important to bring in a designer before buying the property because it would suck to purchase property and then find out that there's wetlands covering the entire property and then that's adding thousands of dollars to what it'll take to build the building. But then alternatively, you go the other way and you think you're gonna save money by starting with a building that's already there, but you need someone to come in and see what condition the building is in, see what condition the electrical systems are in, see what condition the mechanical systems are in, and more likely than not, you're going to have to upgrade that for what it takes to run a cultivation facility. And you want to know those costs before you get started. Thanks so much, Jade. Brian, do you have anything to add? Oh, I think your group has covered it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just put that plug in again for programming, that it, that it is a link between your business plan and your operational plan, is that an early phase, a program uh, like others have said, should be developed uh, while you're looking for property so that you can begin to match and say, yeah, is this property going to fit this program? Uh, what are we really doing? 
uh, think in terms of key performance indicators like grams per square foot. Can you get this many square feet in here to produce what your investor has requested of you or what you told your investor, right? Yeah. That would really suck to get in and find out that you told your investors you're going to make, you know, 400 pounds a year or 4,000 pounds a year and then find out that the facility wasn't capable. So that's that programming is that link between a business plan uh, and your operational plan. Actually, your, your point is, uh, is very good, uh, Brian. I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with a client who uh, is building a, a space and uh, we had a conversation about canopy and what is the definition of canopy and for him, it was having table from one wall to the other with barely three feet for those table to move. And I was trying to tell him, yeah, on paper, it sounds great. I can put 100% canopy if you want in the room. But at the end, you have to look into the code. You have to look into the building. You have to look into all those things. So before you start building and getting in all those things, think about the definition of your business and what you're trying to achieve. Because I don't think you can have 90% canopy in, in one room because, you know, I think people need to move around. And most of the time, the, the fire department is right. going right. to ask you to leave uh, rooms around. And all those questions, they are part of the facility design and they have to come very early on. Yes. I see you shaking your head, LaToya. You're like, yes, I totally understand that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you the fire department is key. You know, you have to adhere to all the different codes. And so if you don't know the codes, your architects should, and they should be able to, you have to listen to all these people that are subject matter experts. You know, I am a grower. I'm not an architect. I'm not a designer. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to just kind of, I know a lot of growers, they get really uh, the big head, so to speak, you know, because they can grow this strand and it's really good. But at the end of the day, you can't design a facility. You have to rely on professionals to guide you and you have to set your ego aside and just, you know, go be a part of that process. So, yeah. And really be in partnership with them, right? Like that's the biggest thing. And really understand who you're partnering with. And this is something that I think is always important you are creating a team around you to be successful. If you're an owner operator planning to be an owner operator, that's what you're doing. So if you hire somebody, and I know this has happened to me, so I, I don't know if it happens to other people, but I'm just speaking for myself. Sometimes there were really smart people around me, but didn't understand who I was, who my company was. And it was very uncomfortable because I felt like they weren't listening to what I needed or wanted. Um, and I had to fire them so that we could get the people that understood what our mission was, what our business strategy was, um, and who didn't talk down to me or because I didn't know what I was talking. I didn't know about architecture. It didn't make me feel like I knew less. So I would really encourage you to interview about two or three different groups and find the people that are your people. There's tons of them out. There's tons of people out there and you will find your people that believe in your mission, that understand what your business strategy is going to be everything that Jacques said, everything that LaToya said. Now I have a yeah. question, there's a little build up of this question because we're talking about people purchasing um, buildings, but there are some people, um, myself included, that lease buildings, we don't actually purchase the buildings. And I understand the value of purchasing the building so that you have the asset. I absolutely understand that. But a lot of people in my, my group um, don't have that kind of capital are not gonna, don't have a house to second mortgage, don't have friends and family to do that. So they're gonna be leasing or renting a property. How does that change the way you interact with a new owner operator that's going to design that facility for a leased property? I can start. Um, the process of working on a leased property versus a um, bought property it's something that us as designers understand how to deal with because part of our job is understanding the limitations to the project and the different codes and rules that are going along with it. So when you have a landlord, that just means that that's just one other person that we need to coordinate with and understand what the restrictions are. And again, even before you lease a property, um, bringing a designer on board to talk to the landlord and make sure that we're allowed to make the modifications needed to make this project work, you want to do that before you purchase the lease or sign the lease. And then are y'all able as the designers or the architects or the um, consultants 
able to talk with them about giving them it's called something i can't remember it right now where they give you some money because you're improving their facility um what is it called i'm sorry i can't remember it i've heard well there's sometimes a tenant improvement ti dollars sometimes a landlord yeah. sometimes a landlord has reserved tenant improvement money to entice or to uh, encourage a tenant to make improvements in general that's really that's probably applicable in retail or you know in you know it's very common in office space that a landlord has tenant improvement dollars they're not going to be significant in a cannabis facility right they're, i don't you should never hold out uh, for the amount of changes that we're, we're going to make to a building um, that there's any real ti dollars or tenant improvement dollars coming from a landlord's way um, but yeah, Jade is, Jade is correct. There's, um, you know, the landlord becomes that extra customer in many ways. You have to make it clear that you're going to put holes in the roof or you're going to, you know, you're going to close doors off or you're going to make, add security upgrades to the building. And that landlord is going to inherit that uh, potentially at the end of a lease agreement. So uh, always keep that landlord uh, included in all the, all the conversations as the, as the design develops. And, and uh you were ask, you know, you're talking about rent versus uh, owning the building, right? You know, you got to keep in mind that the cannabis industry has changed tremendously in the past two or three years. There are ways to buy buildings now. I mean, we we found, you know, a couple of banks that are actually financing real estate. So don't don't take it for granted that you cannot buy it. But at the end, it becomes a business decision, right? When you're about to spend two, three, four, ten million dollars in a building that's not yours on a five-year lease. You know, you got to keep in mind that five years later, the landlord could say, OK, get out of here. And then you're losing your money. So obviously so they negotiate the 10 year lease, the 15 year lease. Well, I was about to say, that. yeah, you, you, you want to negotiate a long term lease or at least with options and maybe a way to buy it. I mean, at this point, you can we, you, we can almost bet that within the next five to 10 years, right, banks will finance cannabis a lot better than it was five years ago. So, you know, maybe you you have an option to buy, you know, say, you know, I can buy it at a set price from now and uh, and it gives you all the options. If you cannot buy it right now, you give yourself the options to buy it later. You also have to think about that the landlord can pay for some of the of those, uh, probably not for the equipment, but, you know, maybe for some air conditioning and things like this. And they are most likely going to recharge you through the rent. So it's somehow some kind of a uh, uh, a loan through the rent that you're getting to get your, your tools right to produce. But you know, as long as you can keep it as long as you need it for your business and give yourself the options, you know, it becomes a, a part of the business planning. Right. And I'll tell you like right now for a lot of our social equity um, it, applicants or people who are owner operators now, they don't have the funds to buy the building. They don't have the, the relationships with the bank stuff. I say this from personal experience. So we don't have the, you know, I don't have a house to second mortgage. I don't have those things. I don't have friends and family that are going to do that. So we're, a lot of people are bootstrapping. We've been bootstrapping from the beginning. And there are people that are bootstrapping that were able to buy their buildings because maybe they had, um, you know, really good investors that were willing to do stuff. I mean, there's a lot of different things. Latoya, I think you mentioned that you own your building. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And when you went to go decide to buy that building, what were what did you what were your criteria? And if you don't mind sharing, how did you do it? <laughs> uh, so I had to be very creative. Um, I have other businesses, so I was able to build my business credit um, just over time. Um, I had a few childcare facilities, and so I had the good enough credit to be able to get a commercial real estate loan in order to purchase uh, the current real estate um, that we run now. Awesome, that's great. So it was a blessing, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it was, it took maybe three or four years to even find the building, okay? It was, it was difficult because the green zones in Detroit, again, the buildings are, are in bad, bad shape. Um, and so this building was actually in decent enough shape for the bank to okay it. And so we had to go through environmental inspections and, and all kind of different inspections before the bank would say, okay. Awesome. Yeah. I, Christine, if I can add to that, that's what, what Latoya just talked about uh, in real estate is called due diligence. And so as you're looking for, for real estate, anyone on the call who's out there thinking about investing, spend time with due diligence. Your designer can assist and an engineering team can assist. So you wanna check into things like, what is the condition of the roof? 
when was it last replaced? Um, uh, Jade mentioned engineers to come out and, and, and investigate how much water is supplied to the building, how much uh, uh, power, how is there gas, and what is the septic? Is it on a well? Uh, you may be required to put in a sprinkler system and find out that there's only a well. And so now you're in, you know, you've got to build a, you know, an above ground tank to supply the fire department with enough water to sprinkle the building. So due diligence in cannabis, it, it's important in every venture in real estate to do your due diligence. But in cannabis, there's a lot of questions to be asked that are very, very specific to your business type uh, that the facility will either support or not support based on what, what you find there. Awesome. So I want to move on and I want to ask you, we're like, let's just think that we're a new owner operator. We just got a license or we're applying for a license and we're starting to do what Jock said is to work on looking for our consultants, work on look, looking for our designers. What are the, what are some important questions that me as somebody looking to hire a firm or a person, what questions should we be asking them to decide whether or not to hire them? I'll, I'll jump into that one. Um, I think one of the differences I learned now in seven years of, of designing cannabis facilities is that, especially cultivation facilities, uh, they are buildings for plants, not buildings for people. And that there are really specific requirements in designing that that design team needs to understand. Like, so, um, you know, a lot of people are architects, like, you know, a lot of architects out there that have never done it before. Uh, and it's really important to pre-qualify based on that understanding of the differences between buildings for plants and buildings for people, right? There's always going to be people in the facility. It always has to meet fire code. It always has to meet building code, but there's so many nuances related to the plant. I would, I would okay. emphasize that. Brian, you missed the number one thing is, are mm. they a member of NCIA? That okay. is the first question. <laughs> Then maybe we ask about any technical questions. All right. Is that no, right, I Christine? Is that the right question? Yes. That is a good question. Absolutely. And also because NCI has so many um, great people who do this work and they're part of our community already. So if you're part of the NCIA, especially, um, you know, you can come into your own, into the NCIA association and ask, you know, and, and vet and be able to talk to people in networks. So that's really important. Actually, Chris, Brian, go to that idea that your family, right? What yeah. many I get calls from people from the NCIA, and it's like talking to family. So it's that's a that's a really Actually, important. Brian, thing. Brian, and I are part of the uh, facility design committee. So I'm not a designer of building. I'm I'm a business designer. Brian is a building designer, and we have a lot of our colleagues and friends part of that committee. And we're actually working hard at creating those standards that Brian was is talking about and and Jade too, you know, the things that, that kind of help people understand what they need to build. Absolutely. I want to add on to what Brian was saying about the experience and design of the building being for the plants. Um, so one of the questions that I think is good to ask is, does the firm, the designer have experience in similar projects because Cannabis is really new, so there's not a lot of people that have experience designing for a cannabis facility specifically, but um, the process of design involves working with the client to make sure that the building performs as they need it. So during the design process, working with the client, you can figure out a good design, but um, also keep in mind the similarities between other projects. For example, Fishback, um, we have experience designing co uh, conservatories and greenhouses for mm. different kinds of plants. So tur turning gears, shifting gears and doing it for cannabis isn't that big of a stretch for us. But yeah. it's important that um, the person that you're asking, the designer that you're asking is honest about their experience. Like I would never say, yeah, I've done tons of cultivation facilities because I haven't. But my company as a whole, like we've worked within the realm of cannabis facilities and we have lots of experience in greenhouses. So I could speak to that, but you wanna make sure that um, they have examples of projects. If they say they've done cultivation facilities, ask for an example. If they don't have one, then they're probably lying. <laughs> totally. How about you, Latoya? Do you have any questions that our up and coming um, operators need to be asking? 
Yeah, and I, I would also say, if you have done it, can we go see it? <laughs> can we actually go and do a tour or visit the facility? Because uh, that, that makes a huge difference. Um, and, and we're going through this all right now, so it's just interesting. Um, when we initially submitted our plans to the city of Detroit, um, we had an architect that didn't have any cannabis experience. And so it was just based off of you know, he and I really communicating, telling them the things that we wanted, we needed. And he got us through that site plan phase and we got approved. Uh, but now we're into the design build phase. And so now we are actually vetting out uh, firms. And the one of the number one requirements for me is, have you done it before? And so, yeah, that is so important to have a team that can look at your site plan and say, hey, you need to put your, your flower room here or the secure loading area should be um, closed off from certain parts of the facility because, you know, so somebody kind of guiding me because they've done it before and they understand the workflow um, as well. That's so, so important. So yeah, yep. number one question. You definitely want, don't want to have three foot walkways for everybody, that's for <laughs> sure. Um, um, also, I have two things I want to add to that. Um, first thing, um, now I'm going to forget my thought. <laughs> Um, Latoya was saying, Latoya, what were you saying? I'm sorry, refresh my memory. Yeah, oh. I was just saying that I would like to visit the facility. If, they, if oh, they're yes. if they've done it before, I would like to actually go and visit the site. So first thing, visiting a facility is difficult only because privacy reasons, some clients, some people that are doing a cultivation, um, they don't want other people seeing their secrets. Um, so that might be difficult, but sometimes the cultivators are willing to show and that's easy to do. The other thing is um, even if the firm or designer doesn't have experience themselves, they can also partner with another company that does have experience, um, which is something that we're doing at Fishbeck when we're so early in the industry, we're bringing in people that are experts. And so as a team, we can put it together. But um, again, just have to be honest about where your experience is. Absolutely. And I would add just what Jade's saying is, yeah, the honesty part. I think there's a human, you, human relationship, right? So when you hire somebody, you want to make sure that you actually feel good about that person. And that person can go the extra mile to resolve your, your issues. Because in, in the cannabis industry, there's a lot of un, still unknown things, right? And we still have to figure out some things because a town or a state decided to do it differently than anything else. And so you also want to find somebody that you know it's going to go the extra mile and help you resolve it. Because we, you know, no, no, not everybody has the, the, the answer, right? You have to find it. So I'm just going to recap really quickly. We need to see what their experience is, see if they have any examples that they can either show you or take you to. We need to talk to them about their knowledge in the particular facility design that you're looking for. And I want to go back to what Jacques said. We need to make sure that they understand what we're, the amount of money or revenue we're trying to make per square footage, whether it's retail, manufacturing, cultivation, or distribution. And I'm going to go back to that because it's super important that you know what that number is for you. And as Brian said, for your investors, because their investors are going to come in and they're going to expect that whatever you put in your executive summary, your business plan, your, you know, um, your uh, performa is going to match that. So it's super important that we connect those two together. Um, so this is always something that is always something I'm always worried about as a CEO. And I'm sure people who are CEOs of their cannabis companies is how much does this cost? Like how much do I need to set aside when, when I, cause when we started in 2016, we kind of just were rolling, we were rolling with it. Like we were like, we're here, we're there, we got it, we're doing it. One night we, we moved an entire facility from one place to the next overnight. Um, because <laughs> that's how we ran back in the day. So, right. um, so now what's that budget? What should I expect to pay to get to, not the build out phase, cause that's a separate thing. We're talking specifically about the person, the design, and understanding how to get that design done for an application or for a new build out. What should we budget for? I could, I, I'll take a stab at it. Um, with not really able to quote any numbers yet, but I'll give you some context, uh, Christine. It's a, it's a big question. I know. Um, so 
as designers, right? Designers, uh, we sell, you know, basically we're service providers. Designers are service providers. And so what we want to know up front is what services does our customer need? We want to tailor the, um, the, the services we provide to the budget, to the scope, right? And, uh, and to the project. So there's a, there's a discovery project for a designer to come up with the number, right? So it's a back and a forth. There's usually, we were talking about, you know, sort of once you start to ask what the qualifications are, the, the designer will begin to ask the, 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 uh, the, the enterprise, the, you know, the entity, well, what are you really looking to do? And Christine, in your question, you mentioned a couple of different things. One might be drawings to support a license application, right? You may need a drawing of a facility to support your license application, depending on your state. Uh, and so that would be uh, one level of investment, right? Is enough, you know, you probably know what it costs to get a, uh, Jacques can speak about what it might cost to actually put an entire license application together. Uh, a drawing is usually a fraction of that cost, right? Because it's one of 1,200 pages that go into a license application. Um, the next milestone, if you will, in design is typically your, once you've purchased the building, you need to go to special permit, right? unless you're in Oklahoma, where you can go straight to the building, building department. Uh, in most states, there is municipal entitlement. So you have to go to your local town's planning board. So that's your next level of investment. And, you know, we, it's hard to determine how many, how many different times do you have to appear in front of the planning board, right? So you need to allow your team some flexibility, right? It'd be great if we could get the planning board to agree on the first visit. What if they charge you? What if they make you come back to a second visit or a third visit, right? And what if they make you bring in a, a um, what if they have odor control mitigation that they didn't tell you about? And then they want to hear about sound mitigation from your, from your equipment, right? Those are additional people. So it's really hard to always to say how much does it cost, right? You need to know how many different hurdles your team has to jump through. So flexibility, I, I would say, some flexibility, um, but if I had to throw out a number, I should say that you could carry six to eight percent of construction costs. Is your design okay. is your design cost between six and eight percent of construction costs? Sure. And the reason I ask that is because what I've found when I've done my own due diligence for my own company is that I'll have what I consider a shady answer, which is, well, how much is your budget? <laughs> what? What? Um, yeah. My budget is a dollar. Give it to me. You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> and right. I, hate that. I hate when they do that to me. That's why I want to give people a sense of what it would cost so they know. Like, and I will tell you, if somebody ever says to you, what's your budget? Just say thank you and move on because I hate that. I hate that question. I, um, go ahead, Jade. I kind of disagree with that. Um, okay. It's just the nature of what the design industry is like is that, um, like Brian said, it's going to be a percentage of your construction costs. So if your all-in budget for the whole project is a million dollars, then we know that we need to go backwards and um, say what your construction costs could be so that including our design fees, you stay under a million. Or it could be you want the building to be a million dollars for sure, and then our design fees would be a fraction of that added to it, and then that's your all-in cost. So I think when they ask what your budget is, it's more what your all-in budget is and not your budget for the design services because they are based specifically on the project. So how does that work? I'm a new company. I'm starting out. I'm going to go get investment, right? I need the, the plan, the, the, the floor plan, in order to understand for my building that I've chosen, to understand what the build-out's going to be. Yeah. I can't well, get... No. Go yes, ahead. yes, and no. Because okay. if if you're about to go raise money, you mm -hmm. need first you need to know what you're doing. So it starts with what's what's my business, what am I trying to accomplish here, uh, what's my long term, short term goal and long term goal. I'm, I do I want to sell this business within three years or do I want to keep it for my great grandchildren? Gotcha. And and so you know you keep in mind what you want to do, and then you. you you know, the, to look for uh, investors, you don't need a full plan from Brian and Jade, you know, because you, 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 you don't have enough information to actually ask them to produce the plans that you want. Plus, you have to keep in mind, it's just not Jade and Brian, you have other engineers that have got to come in place, right, that, that work with them for the loads, for the 
for the water, for the electricity, for the air conditioning. So the first, the first step to me is, is working on, on your business model and then understand what am I trying to accomplish? And then what is my overall budget? Because you have to realize that everybody needs to get compensated. And then you know, a lot of the clients that come to us that already started, what they're missing is all the other things that they don't want to acknowledge. The fact that you know, the architect has to be paid, that you have to uh, buy products before you sell them. Uh, the cost, the, the cost of, of a broom and all the cleaning supply is not 50 bucks. It's a lot of money. And I'm, you know, I'm making up all those things, but you have all those small things that are around your core business model that you just look at and, and you come up with a global budget. And then based on what Jay and Brian were saying, then, then now you can go back to them and say, based on my calculation, I need 30,000 square feet of a growth side because I think I need this. And then they're going to be able to guide you and they're going to be able to tell you, yeah, for 30,000 square feet in that location, you know, based on X dollar per square foot, this is how much it's going to cost you. And uh, this is how much I'm going to ask you to get paid. Then once you go, once you have this, you can go to an investor and say, I have good people behind me. You know, Brian, Jade can, can help me build it. I need X million of dollar. Can you help me? And then how, that's how you reconcile your story. Gotcha. And you can discuss this with the architect before hiring them. Like you tell them what you want to do, what you're trying to do, what your budget is. They'll put together a proposal of cost, show that to you, and then you decide. So it's really important that if you're thinking of starting, like contact some designers, have that conversation and get costs for what you're trying to do. They'll ask the right questions. And if you don't have the answers, then you can either pay them to help you find the answers or you find the answers and come back. Um, but step one, I think just contact a designer and find out. Contact and I don't think me. there's one price. <laughs> you know, you, you just like a house, you, you can build a very cheap house with one bedroom and barely water and electricity in it. Or you can build, you know, um, $65 million house. At the end, you're still gonna sleep in it and hopefully you're gonna have a good sleep. It, it's, but it's still a house. It's the same thing for everything else. You can spend as much money as you want. It's just you have to know what the end result is going to be and what you're going to get out of it. But let's just say, and I agree with everything y'all are saying. So thank you. Thank you for clarifying to me, Jade, why they always ask us. And this is why we have y'all on this call. Why do you ask what your budget is? The reason I say that is because for me personally, and then for a lot of folks that I know um, who are just uh, are about to apply for licenses and coming into that, when I, if I had gone to you in 2016, this is what I would have known. I would have known that I have a 1400 square foot space. It has a bathroom that's accessible and I need to build a retail shop out of it. That's what I would have known. That's the extent of what I would have known. I would have told you that I could buy my weed for about a hundred grand and stock the whole store. And I got these, um, these uh, display cases from the Goodwill and we repainted right. them and redid that. I could tell you that stuff, but I wouldn't know to be able to tell you like, I need to make, and, and again, I didn't have Jacques. So um, I didn't know to tell you like, I need to make, you know, 14, you know, $1,400 per square foot. And a lot of times when we're going into this, we are going into it with that amount of knowledge, especially if we're moving in from the legacy market. And so I right. just really want people to be, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'll let everybody talk. I, I just really want to be clear that Yes, I agree with all of the things that you're saying. And I will tell you that in some cases, in many cases, the designers and, and facility designers and architects have to meet us where we are. And we're not always at the place. I could come to you and say, I have a million dollars. I, I don't have a million dollars, but that's what I'm planning to spend on the million dollars. But I've also got the 7,000 square foot space. So what can I do with that? You know what I mean? So I just want to yeah. clarify that I, I understand the budget, but sometimes we don't know it. That's right. part of our job is to have that conversation before you hire us. So if you came to me with that information, I would ask follow-up questions. I would ask if you have a building, I would ask to see the building. And if that is going to take time, then we would discuss the cost of that, like just due diligence, seeing the building, make a proposal, and then I'll go through the work of vetting out the building for you and telling you what it's capable of doing. And then we would sign a different proposal if you wanted to go ahead and design for that building. Ah, and then good. you would get a different cost. So 
that's why the conversation is important because there's so many services that we can offer. We have to figure out what you need and what you're capable of doing on your own. And that's great because we didn't, I didn't know that till just now, but I could hire you to do the thing called due diligence, which is right. really hiring you for the bigger project. So that's right. great information. Thank you. Programming also, Christine, I'll add that programming can be a standalone service. So you could hire just to understand due diligence. Another word is feasibility study. You might do a feasibility study. Um, programming is another standalone service. The other piece that anyone on the call can do themselves is benchmarking. Really go out and look what similar costs are to build a nail salon. What's the cost to build a, you know, to build a similar size retail store? Right. And really do your homework about not just cannabis. Right. You don't want to pay the cannabis tax. Right. You don't want to pay more just because this is this is weed. And that has traditionally plagued a lot of a lot of businesses. Um, but go out and do benchmarking. Find out what you know, what is your cousin who just built a store to, to, to do something. Right. What was that cost? And uh, that can help. That can help de demystify as the title of this is right. Demystifying what it costs okay. to build things. Another factor that's included in calculating price is the labor itself. So every employee that will be working on the design of the building will have a billable rate and an amount of time that it'll take them to produce the drawings or do the work. And most architecture firms, I think, would list that out for you and say, this person, this rate, this many hours, this person, this rate, this many hours. And that calculates what that fee will be. So. That's why it's really difficult to determine without knowing the specifics because something could take 10 hours to design and something could take 24. So it really depends on the project. So I feel like we just demystified something really big here that you don't have to do all of the money up front. You can do it in pieces. Yep. You could budget for it and that there's help for people who need to have the first part that due diligence, that feasibility study. Latoya, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just, just wanted to kind of share our, our personal story. I mean, we definitely have been doing everything in phases uh, to get us to the site plan. I would say that was about eight, eight grand to get us to the site plan review. Um, and then to push us to the construction document phase, that can be anywhere. And we've gotten quotes anywhere from 30,000 uh, to 70,000 for a 10,000 square foot grow canopy with about maybe 2,500 to maybe 3,000 square feet of processing uh, space, including like a kitchen and uh, security. And so it, it really does depend, but I would say just if your social equity or depending on whoever, you know, what your financing situation is, set aside at least $100,000. And that's before any brick gets moved, anything gets put up, about $100,000. You heard it here first, or maybe you didn't, but <laughs> set aside about $100,000 before somebody even picks up a hammer. Yeah. So that's good to know. Thank you for that. Yeah, because the plans that they put together are going to be what the other, the trades, the skilled trades, if they follow those directions and build your facility. So you want to make sure that, you know, those are correct before you actually start to construct, so. And that's what the designers and architects main job is to draw the plans for the building so that the construction workers know what they're doing and don't have that many questions. And a really good set of drawings won't have a lot of questions. A really bad set of drawings will have a lot of questions. And then all of that gets added into the construction cost. So that's why going with a really good firm or designer that knows what they're doing will save you costs during the construction process. Awesome. All right. So I wanted to, um, does anybody else have anything to add before we move on to the final question? Go for it. Okay. So I have been reading and hearing a lot um, about around ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And it's starting to become a buzzword in the cannabis industry. It's been a buzzword everywhere else for a while. And I was hoping that some of y'all, all of y'all, whoever wants to answer can talk about what y'all are doing around ESG when you're designing facilities and what the owner operators should consider around ESG as we move into the 21st century. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I don't know, Latoya, Latoya, why don't you go ahead? No, no, it, no. Was, it was Jade. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Jade. 
Oh, uh, I was just gonna say that, um, so the S in ESG and the E are really important in the cannabis industry, um, the G as well, I guess they're all important, but focusing on the E part, um, these cultivation facilities use a lot of energy and it's really important that that is considered when designing the space. So the architect should be coordinating with the grower, understanding what the grower's needs are, and then coordinating with the mechanical and electrical designers, and then coordinating with the construction team to make sure that all of those systems are designed as small as possible for what needs to be done. And um, I, in my opinion, I think it's really important that all these facilities come into the industry with the lowest environmental impact so that people don't have a reason to push back on the industry and start limiting the number of facilities. So using LED lighting or using um, a photovoltaic grid instead of traditional electricity, like those are all options that can be thought through. And that's something that the designer can help work through the cost of that versus the return on investment versus how much budget you have available. Like that's all part of our job. I agree with you. I, you know, as I said, I'm not a designer that, like you guys are, but I have to admit that 10 years ago when we designed our first facility, I made, I made a lot of mistakes that way. I didn't have the right um, advisors around the energy cons uh, consumptions and, and, and the contact with the community. So we actually paid a lot of attention to the, you know, the social part and the community, but on the environmental, environmental side, I just got the wrong information and 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 you know that's something I learned the hard way because once you built it you 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 know you can do I mean once your air conditioning is in 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 place and you get all those uh, HPA slides you know it, there's there's no turning back and uh, so um, it's something to take into consideration very early on. Yeah. I have um, spent a lot of time with customers now over the years early in the process applying for. Uh, municipal entitlements, right? Special permit at the town from the planning board. And one of the things that I've come to really believe is that cannabis is a good neighbor. So from an ESG perspective, all three of those pieces can be clear, need to be clearly represented to your town and your community when you're bringing this business forward. Cannabis is a good neighbor. So if, for example, if you're renovating a building, Talk about the security that your operation is going to bring. Talk about the jobs that your operation is going to bring, right? You're going to put exterior lighting in that. You're going to light the parking lot. You're going to have security cameras. Emphasize all those positive pieces that your facility is going to bring. If you're going into a mill building that's been abandoned for 15 years, talk about the jobs. Talk about, go, to the, go to the town planner and talk about taxes. You are going to bring and pay a lot of taxes to that community, and you're going to be a good neighbor, right? You're going to, you know, you're probably going to upgrade the utilities to that building. These are all positive pieces, right? Talk to the other neighbors who might be out there with the torches and pitchforks, and talk about odor control, right? And that you're not going to just dump your, you know, moisture-laden air into the night sky in that neighborhood and have everybody smell, you know. I love the smell of cannabis, but some people complain about it, right? So you want to make sure that, that, that neighbors understand that you know how to control that, right? And sound control. Everybody should be able to have, you know, a peaceful night's sleep and not hear a large air conditioning unit running 24 seven. And so if you pay attention to the details um, from energy, sustainability and governance um, and just keep talking about them in a positive light, you know, the neighbors will catch on. And I think right. that a lot of municipalities actually require you to have a meeting with the community before approving the site plan. So thinking through those things and having a good story ready will help. Yep. Yeah, we engaged pretty early on with an energy sustainability uh, company um, local here, uh, where he um, he basically has a natural gas power plant. So we potentially could be completely 100% off the grid um, with his natural gas power plant. So we're really excited about that. Um, it's, it's a, a huge expense, um, but the cost savings, you pretty much pay, a, pay it off in three years. Um, but then there is that noise situation, something like that is, is pretty noisy. So you kind of have to 
weigh the risk versus the reward. Um, but but there are the LED components that will allow you to you know decrease your footprint. Uh, so there are different ways that you can can really be more energy sustainable, especially when you talk about the compost and the waste that you'll you know be producing in, in ways that you can maybe use those materials in, in a more efficient way. Well, I appreciate all of this insight. It's amazing. I put on my glasses because I got to read the Q&A. So it's a Q&A portion. Um, so I want to start because I want to make sure we have time to that. One of the questions we had, and I think this is for you, John. Can I add something that we, we didn't mention is employees too. Okay. I think in everything we talked about, this is a business. You Everybody's got to take care of their employees and think about what they need. They need, they need lockers. They need break room. They need safety. They need, they need training. And that's part of the design of the facility. Yes, and absolutely. 100%. I wanted to mention that in the uh, ESG part, right? It's employees are part of it. Yes. I agree. 100%. Sorry, right, Christine. I think that's okay. I think this is a question for you. The question is why does an exit strategy, sell in three years or keep it for my grandchildren, matter? Wouldn't the best practices apply in both situations? Yep. So I, I saw the question and somebody replied about Ohio too. You know, it, it, it all depends on, on what, what are your goals, right? You, you, you want to stage your investment. And if your goal is to sell in two years from now, for whatever reason, then you might want to show something that is a little bit outside of uh, the norm of somebody who wants to keep the business for the next 10, 20 years, right? Because you, you're trying to speed things up or slow things up because you might want to say, hey, you know, I'm not going to invest in this because I'm hoping in a year and a half from now, somebody's going to have to take care of it. So, oh, so look, think about that in terms of regulations, right? We yeah. just heard Schumer talk about legalizing this. If this is legalized at the federal level, then the FDA gets involved. The FDA gets involved. We're talking about current good manufacturing practices. CGMP is the required standards. Today, I have customers ask me, why would I do that? Why would I put boot washers in my, you know, I don't, I don't have to do that. My state's not requiring that. So that is a short-term exit strategy. They don't want to spend, you know, if you don't want to spend the money today, you build it quick, get it operational and sell it because when the big fish is going to want to eat the small fish, right? When somebody's helicoptering over your town and looking for, for, for facility to buy, they're going to want to buy the facility that was designed for the 20-year plan, right? The one that invested money in every detail and put money into every piece uh, so that's that's how I think about what Jacques mentioned in terms of exit strategy. Okay. Um, thank you for the answer. I have another question that came in from our FB feed. The question is, should I invest in a space for retail before legalization or should I wait? So I'll take that one for a second. I would not invest in any space until you know what's happening because unless you have a crystal ball then you don't know where you're going. And, you know, I'm, I'm in Portland, Maine, and uh, they've been talking about having licenses here for the past three or four years. And I've seen people leasing spaces for two years and they had to let it go because the town said maximum 2,000 square feet. Well, you just paid for 5,000 square feet for two years and you can use it. And, you know, and people were buying buildings and we've seen it in Massachusetts. I've seen it in Ohio. I've seen it in Michigan. You know, just, just wait. Uh, I mean, people are doing it right now in New York and New Jersey, right? And uh, Georgia, Georgia is about to announce this week. Georgia is going to announce the uh, their their uh, licenses, and there is no retail system in Georgia today, and they did not put a retail operation in their plans. So there's going to be facilities opening with no retail operations. So if that caller from Facebook, you know, do they want to buy retail facilities in Georgia right now to support? The coming and, the, and Jacques' question is absolutely appropriate. How long can you hold on to that property before the industry catches up to you? And um, and keep in mind that the zoning might not be the right one because right? you know if the town says no, we don't want it there. Then you, so you know it's business. You you look at your risk, you make your decision. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. I have one last question, um, and in our last few minutes, um, and this one is. Um, one of the largest facility cost components is the HVAC applications and solutions. How do you guide clients through that? So 
I'd say one of the first things to think about is your, um, so we're talking about cultivation facilities here, right? That's where the HVAC is, is so critically important. And um, sometimes 60% of your build out cost can be two trades, mechanical and electrical, right? Uh, plumbing in, uh, is, is lower down, but those two trades can be massively expensive. So engage, engage a team that works well with your architect and your designers. Engage, apply the same things we talked about at the top of this call is bring the engineers in early Thank as part you. of the team. And I'll just add that it'll be really important to have a grower and a process in order to design the right system. So it's possible to design a generic system, but you may end up spending more money to have that bigger range than if you were to design specifically for your grow process. So understanding how many employees will be there, what their workflow will be, um, what the temperature needs to be, what the humidity needs to be, what the cycle will be, like understanding all of that sooner rather than later will help design an efficient facility. Awesome. Yeah. I just want to add too, I mean, how many plants you're going to be growing because, you know, the transpiration rate is different based off of how many plants. Um, okay. And then there's a lot of companies out there. There are gold standard companies. Um, Quest, I would recommend getting, you know, just finding out the cost of their machines. They're a really good company. And there's a few others that I would say, you know, do your due diligence, get quotes based off the size of your um, building. Also, you can, you know, send them. They're very like, you know, eager to help. You can send them your site plans. If you have some preliminary drawings, send them over to those companies and let them take a look at it and they'll give you some feedback. This has been such an awesome conversation. And I want to just tell each and every one of you how much I appreciate what you've done, how you've done it, the knowledge you've dropped on us today. It's been amazing. I want to offer one more thing. If any of you have one more parting gem that you want to share with our audience, this is being streamed also on Facebook. It's also being, uh, it's going to be posted again so people can review it on the website. Do y'all have any singular gem that you're like, this is something you should know. Feel free to drop it now before Brian leads us out. Well, I would say from a grower's perspective, from a person that's been a caregiver and started off growing a couple of plants in my basement and closet, um, be patient with yourself if you're at the level where you're you know, designing out a facility because it's, it's a lot of information that'll be thrown at you um, so be patient, allow yourself to, uh, you know, really dive deep into the process so you know exactly once the facility is operating, you know, where, how it works. You, you want to be a part of the process because um, it really just empowers you from all aspects. So just be patient with yourself. That's awesome advice. Anyone else? I would say... Um, just bring in a designer as early as possible. Um, don't make a mistake by picking the wrong equipment or going through the wrong process when there's someone out there that can help you navigate all that. Um, the cost of the designer will pay for itself in the end when you don't have to go back and hire one after the fact to fix an issue. It's much easier to fix it before it's built. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 give, I'll give you one, Christine and everybody. It's the penny, dime and dollar analogy. The penny is the money you spend on design. The dime is the many, money you spend on your facility. The dollar in proportion is your cost for ongoing operational efficiencies. So don't, trying to squeeze that at first penny to save on the dime, to save on the dollar is a fool's errand. It is a tiny drop in the bucket to have a good team support a good facility because the massive amounts of cost and income you would put in jeopardy by squeezing it doesn't pay off in the end. Thank you for that. I'm going to remember it. Penny, and my, advice is, my advice is simple. Listen to what Jade, Latoya, and Brian said. <laughs> <laughs> I love that idea. Well, Brian, that's the end of our, our webinar. Thank you, everybody who joined us today. I'm so grateful for the panelists. You dropped a lot of knowledge on for me as well. We appreciate you. Brian, it's all you. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Christine, for facilitating such an insightful conversation. Um, I thought that this was a perfect uh, capstone on top of another webinar um, that was hosted by our facilities design committee in particular last week. Um, I know a few of us have mentioned it inside of the chat room. So if you all are looking for a continued deep dive into today's topic, you can follow that uh, link that we put into the chat room as well to view that session. Um, and while we're uh, leading everybody out, why doesn't everybody in the audience give a big virtual round of applause to this amazing panel? If you enjoyed yourself today, raise your hand in the audience pool or post inside of the chat room and let us know what you're taking away from today's session um, and how uh, insightful today's conversation was for you as well. Um, and I also, Brian, I wanted to do a quick shout out because I it was terrible. Mike Lamoto was the person that was handling all of the Q&A and all of the chat. And he is my co-moderator. Um, he's the slash or the dash. Thank you so much, Mike, for being so awesome and helping us put this together. We could not have done it without you. Yeah, couldn't echo those sentiments any stronger. Um, thank you, Mike, for helping assist this and helping lead our uh, DEIC committee specifically. Um, if you all uh, wanted to take note of any of our panelists' contact information, um, please do from this contact information slide. Stay on the lookout for your inbox. We'll also send over a PDF version of today's slideshow as well so that you can coordinate any follow-up um, outreach with the panelists as well. And then um, to close out today's program, while our panelists leave the virtual stage, um, we're going to give you a quick preview of some upcoming webinars taking place later this week that we'd love all of your all's participation in before we dive into our end of event credit sequence, highlighting all of our social equity scholarship recipients. So uh, tomorrow we'll be broadcasting another edition of our Committee Insights series entitled Hot Topics for Accounting and Tax for the Cannabis Industry. During this webinar, we'll have experts from NCIA's Banking and Financial Services Committee explore various topics around cannabis banking, accounting, and tax issues. Head to the cannabisindustry.org slash events today to secure your pass for that program. Additionally, a huge shout out and thank you to the benefactors of NCIA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Program with this month's featured uh, companies including Tahoe Wellness Center. Oh, excuse me, didn't mean to advance there. There we go. Uh, this month's featured companies, including Tahoe Wellness Center, Copper State Farms, Greenbridge Corporate Council, Forefront Ventures, and the law offices of Omar Figueroa. These businesses have taken their commitment to social justice to the next level by providing significant financial support for all of our DEI efforts across the association. You can learn more about these initiatives on NCIA's website by following the short link on this page, then join the ranks of these pioneering businesses pushing for a more equitable industry today. And with that, thank you all so much, as always, for participating in yet another NCIA Industry Essentials educational webinar. A huge thank you once again to all the members of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, as well as the Facility Design Committee for co-hosting today's session and presenting it for all of our audience members and member businesses, which make our work possible each and every day. Uh, you'll be directed to a short attendee survey after the meeting room closes. Please do complete that to provide us some invaluable uh, insights on how to improve these future programs moving forward. And then as Christine mentioned, do stay on the lookout for our formatted video recording of today's session to be posted first inside of our members only community platform, NCIA Connect, and then stay on the lookout for a public premiere of the session to be hosted later in the upcoming weeks. Um, and we'll be coordinating a uh, live premiere with some of the panelists to continue the conversation from there. Uh, as always, we'll leave you all with this end of event credit sequence highlighting the 100 and plus member businesses that make up our social equity scholarship program and who participated in this afternoon's session alongside some lo-fi audio stylings by yours truly. Uh, if you don't see your company highlighted, that means you need to head to the cannabisindustry.org slash join following today's session to join the movement for a responsible and equitable cannabis industry. Enjoy, and we hope to see you tomorrow afternoon for our next Industry Essentials Educational Webinar broadcast. Thanks. We'll see you then.